Okay, welcome to episode three of the Tyler's Tech Podcast. I'm here with Zero and we've got a special guest today, OTB. Do you want to be called... Sh- how do you want me to refer to you in this video, OTB? <laughs> Steve, OTB, whatever you like. I'm going to go, hey, to, you. I'm going to, go to Steve. <laughs> okay. How's everyone doing? Yeah, good. Good, thanks. Yeah, I'm doing pretty well. How was your dog walk? Was it fun? It was amazing, mate. <laughs> getting that getting that message from you halfway around, like, can you record now? I was like, uh, no, but <laughs> I can take the shortcut. <laughs> so, how has has coronavirus affected you at all, Steve? Um, well, the virus itself hasn't affected. No, me. Well, um, thank God for that. I, I, I mean, I live in a little village in the back end of Lancashire. You know, there's not many people here, and I don't think there's been an instance of it. Uh, but certainly. The end of March, everything was locked down. So I spent, well, three months anyway, doing nothing but on furlough and working from home, which was a bit strange for me. Uh, My wife said she'd never seen me so white because I hadn't (laughs) been out of the house for three months. (laughs) But actually, I'm good with it. (laughs) I'm, I'm quite happy. Have you noticed an increase in viewership like since it began? The first few months, yes, yeah. but uh, I, I was also doing more videos while I was on furlough, um, so I was putting it down to that, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it, it's been fine. Things are slowly getting back to normal, but at the moment, we seem to be in this halfway house. I mean, I don't know what you guys, uh, what your situation is. I'm on something called flexible furlough at the moment. Um <laughs> Which means, yeah, it's neither fish nor fowl, is it? Which means that they can call me in when they need to. So I'll get up tomorrow morning, and it's all about whether or not I'm working, and I won't know until I get a phone call in the morning whether or not I'm working that day. So you can't really plan ahead, you know. And, uh, yeah, so it's been strange. I suppose it's given me a view of what it's like to be retired, (laughs) Um, <laughs> which I'm, I'm all good with actually <laughs> it, I've just got this annoying thing that, thing that I still need to earn money to pay the bills but <laughs> yeah, it, you does, know. Uh, it does happen so what are you um, wh- I just watched your latest video on the uh, YouTube the, what it's like to be a YouTube Linux YouTube guy and your tips and stuff oh that one yeah <laughs> what, what made you decide to do that It almost sounds like uh, there's some notion of planning ahead here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there isn't that much planning ahead. The way that I do this, my videos are not necessarily planned more than a day in advance, if truth be known. I? I get I get lots of suggestions from uh, the comments and from a Facebook group, and I make a big list of them. And gen- And it was on that list, you know the nuts and bolts of uh, running a YouTube channel. And on the Saturday morning or whatever day it was, I looked at it and I thought, what should I do today? Yeah, I fancy doing that. Don't fancy doing a review today. And it was as simple as that. (laughs) That's all it takes sometimes. So yeah, I want to kind of talk about your, because you've been jumping into the whole DWM stuff. What was you using desktop wise before you went into the Windows managers and stuff? Marty or mate. (laughs) <laughs> this I, been I, a... saw, I, I saw your video saying I'm the only one that calls it Marty and I have to force myself to call it Marty because you want to say mate if you're English don't you well that's <laughs> that's kind of been a contentious topic in all of my videos every time I do a mate or Marte video it's always Ooh. one of the the top comments is like it's actually pronounced Marte and I'm like oh god I know uh, I know it's so. just one of those things we like to butcher pronunciations of big things don't we like we don't say ikea correctly we say we're supposed to say ikea aren't we are we no idea are we i thought it was ikea yeah yeah, yeah. You, you you watch the tv adverts and the guy says ikea at the end you've just like, dro- mm. you've, uh, right <laughs> you've just dropped a total bomb on me i wasn't aware that, that was uh that was a thing or you, or you know car brands like skoda like you're supposed to say skoda i can kind of see that one actually i can kind of see that <laughs> Well, after I watched your video, I thought, right, enough of this pretension. I'm going to call it mate from now on. Good. I'm, I'm happy we've had some sort of effect on you with that one. Yeah. So, so yeah, the mate desktop. Um, I bobbed in, in and out between mate and XFCE. Um, and it all goes back many, many years for me. Um, I mean, I started using Linux in 2004. Right. And, and it was the KDE versus GNOME 
uh, flame and where wars did you then. fall on that side of the debate? Gnome 2. Gnome 2 all the way. Wow. Um, never liked KDE that much. Um, the only time I used it was when I uh, used a distro called Mepis, which is long gone. Uh, but it was a very popular distro at the time. Where do I know um, that from? Is that is that is that transformed into anything else? Is there? Any yeah, um, it's transformed into uh, MX or or anti -X, It is it? MX. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, knew, yeah, I, knew so. I knew the name from somewhere. Yeah. So, uh, but but GNOME was always for me. I I found uh, KDE didn't like the massive uh, configuration options in it. GNOME did enough. Then they got rid of GNOME two, didn't they? And went to GNOME three. And well, what do you think about GNOME three? Oh, where do I start? Um, <laughs> <laughs> for me, it starts and stops at the Teletubbies menu. Yeah, I just look at that and I, I think to myself, do you think I'm five years old that I need these huge icons on my screen? Um, I just hate the workflow with it. Absolutely loathe it. And at the time, we didn't have much choice because... When GNOME made that awful decision to go to uh, GNOME 3, yeah. KDE was transitioning as well to KDE 4, so that was a mess as well. It was buggy as hell. At the beginning, and, it was, yeah. Yeah, for quite a long time. And uh, so um, in the end, I, I, I kind of sought refuge in XFCE, and uh, I was on that for a couple of years until Mate matured enough and... Uh, Mate gives me the GNOME 2 experience, yeah. which I always liked. And that's why I stick with name, uh, you know, GNOME 2, Mate, because I found the desktop environment that I liked, that I was comfortable with. I've never seen a need to go beyond it. Have you tried KDE recently? Yeah, I have, and it's improved massively. Um, mm. It's no longer the huge resource-intensive thing that it used to be back in the day. You used to the um, GNOME now. Mm, I know. I I mean, when did I look at it last? Was it uh, when I did that Open SUSE uh, review? I think I used uh, Plasma on that, didn't I? Yeah, I think you did. Yeah, I, th I, I think it's fine now. You know, I mean, it's become very usable. Usable. It's not too heavy. Um, I'll still use Mate if I use a desktop environment, though. Although the chances of me using a full desktop environment these days are getting less and less and less as I seem to be moving more towards window managers only. And that was fairly recent, wasn't it, your sort of jump to the windows managers? Yeah, it was. Um, I tried Openbox, and um, I configured Openbox, and I was pretty pleased with Openbox as a floating window yep. manager, obviously. And by the time I'd played with it and got it working as I wanted it, even a little menu in the top left-hand corner... It was pretty much working like mate. Um, and I thought, wow, well, if I can get this going with, you know, just a straightforward window manager, do I really need a desktop environment? And I couldn't see why I would. Do you not miss, of desktop, it, do you not miss any on. of the creature comforts that you get with a desktop? Such as? Oh, good point, actually. Um, tighter integration with certain applications, then. I haven't found it a problem. No. So zero, you don't use any you just KDE straight straight up always, aren't you? Yeah, pretty much. I mean I have the mm. latte dock at the bottom, but other than that I haven't really messed with it too much. Have you ever tried um uh, Windows managers or anything like that? A long, long time ago <laughs> I um I think I tried reg regolith, regolith. Regolith, yeah. Well that's like no yeah, more sorry, guys, I am a smoker. That's all right. <laughs> Yeah, I think I I think I tried it, and um, it pushing keyboard buttons isn't particularly intuitive for me because I I can't spread my fingers across the keyboard quite as I think you're supposed to be able to if you're using them full time. That took me um, the longest time to get used to until I got yeah. all my, my my own key bindings, and basically they're all now super alt something. So yeah. you know, two keys next to each other, so they're all nice and simple. I'm the opposite. Yeah. So where, where do you guys keep your hands on your desk then? Do you always have one hand on your mouse? Normally, yeah. Right, yeah. okay. In fact, I still do even with tiling window managers because I, I haven't become keyboard only. I still use my mouse. 
I've always just had my hands on the on the keyboard, and I only ever divert to the mouse, obviously, when I need to have some mouse input. Right. I mean, it might be a bit weird then. Mm. The biggest thing that I got was I, I realised that I had this fear about losing my system tray. Now, you know, your likes of i3 and what have you have a system tray, but not mm-hmm. all win- window managers have one. And I thought, oh, my God, what am I going to do without a system tray? How do I connect to, you know, wireless networks, et cetera, et cetera? You don't need one. There are great command line tools that do exactly the same thing. When I thought about what I had in my system tray, I had a volume icon. I had uh, the Pamac thing, yep. you know, for uh, for Arch. And I had Network Manager, all of which I can access on the command line and set up from there. So I don't miss it at all now. That's another thing I hate pronouncing is PAMAC, PAMAC. I never know how you meant to say PAMAC. It's a horrible piece of software. Um, and anybody who uses it to actually install anything is, uh, in my experience, looking for problems. It's great as an update, update notifier. Yeah, yeah. It's great to search for packages. But if you're going to install from the AUI, you should just use Yay or something similar just on the command line. So when you checked out OpenSUSE, what was your sort of takeaway thoughts as a, as a whole? I thought it came across as a... It wasn't a surprise, really, because I've checked in and out over the years at OpenSUSE, and um, it hasn't changed much in look and feel for the last 10 years or so, <laughs> from what I can see. You know, it likes its green, doesn't it? Um... <laughs> I think that... I, I, do only, I, do they need some new polish i think to to open to so it does feel a bit stagnant and just a, like the aesthetics it it's gone very quiet you know from the outsider's point of view open Sousa. you don't hear a lot about it now in in the linux world which which, which is strange because Sousa 9.2 personal was the very first linux distro i tried i wow. bought it as a box version from uh, pc world how much back in two that I can't even remember. 2000, it never worked anyway. Um, I, I was putting it on an old K62 machine, and the machine itself was too old to run anything then, so it it never installed properly and never worked. But I did try OpenSUSE late, later on a different machine, in fact, just before it moved to OpenSUSE, when it was just SUSE. Right. And, yeah, it was great. Um, I had a an NVIDIA card at the time, and one of the problems that I had with it was every time the kernel upgraded, it would completely trash the system and I could never get it back up and running again, and I'd have to reinstall. But but I was quite new to Linux at the time. Um, so what do I think about it? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's not really many bad distros at the moment, is there? I don't um, know about that. Well, it depends how hard you look, I suppose. I don't really like Yast. I don't like the idea of Yast. I don't know why we need it. I've floated in between disliking mm. it and then liking it. I, so Zero is like the open Sousa guy, and I think you might be able to make a good argument for Yast. Mm. Uh, so the one thing that I really liked about Yast, and this was ages ago before I was even mainlining uh, mm-hmm. Linux on my PC mm-hmm. was when I was trying to set up a firewall on a VPS right. and I was using the YAST um, NCURSES interface and trying to set up the system using that and it had like the automated web server install and deployment and management through the NCURSES interface and the opening the firewalls and putting it, things into the different zones on the NCURSES mm-hmm. and I was like Trying to do this with Firewall D just through command line arguments would be an absolute pain in the backside for want of a better expression because I, I, I still haven't learned the Firewall D syntax because I haven't had to because Yast has taken care of it all and right. I have a, a Samba share on my home server that I've set up through Yast and it just <laughs> works and I haven't had to go in and edit the config files or anything like that to get it working like i had to on ubuntu um and it's kind of like i don't know for for people who want to like just set something up quickly without having to type in a million and one Mm -hmm. arguments it's quite useful but i think there is a ufw of course i I configured that on my uh vps yeah quick command really easy Yeah. yeah i do like ufw as well but if you're on OpenSUSE, you're kind of tied into yeah. Firewall D, I guess. Mm. 
I'm trialing open Sousa Tumbleweed as like a, a daily driver at the moment. Well, it was Tumbleweed, uh, yeah, Tumbleweed that I I did the review on because I like the rolling release model. Yeah. So uh, I did mine. On I was going. Go on. Sorry, go on. No, Tyler. it's all good. It's all good. I, I mentioned on my video that I was actually going to install it, and um, I was going to install it on one of my SSDs and replace Void Linux. Uh, haven't done that yet can't seem to force myself to wipe void off the ssd i'm afraid <laughs> have you tried um nix nix os nixos no I, i've watched your video i think you should give I've it a go tried it yeah hmm. i've only i've very I've, I've barely scratched the surface with it to be fair though i'm gonna i really want to sort of get in deep and see what it's actually like to use as a an overall daily driver but i've got it installed onto an external now just so i can sort of plug in my sort of external ssd and have a little play around with it and right. I'm, i really quite like it oh okay I mean, it, it, it's another one of those things that's on the list that I've not got to yet. Um, I will no doubt try it and do a review. Yeah, um, I do. But the thing is, of course, if it's very different, it's going to be a very long video, that, because I tend to explore as I go. So, uh... <laughs> yeah, when, I, when I'm doing a new distro, I don't really do any practice runs or anything like that. I'll just install yeah. it. And then chuck the camera on, and then I'll be off and I'll go. And then I'll I'll often do like a second follow up video to it if I if I like right. it, basically. Uh, my, my mine's sort of uh, I switch the camera on and go, and then I normally have to cut an hour and a half's worth of recordings down to about forty minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I have this um, thing. I like, I hate starting a video. I never know what like. So I've I've always got yeah. like ten. 10 10 second clips of me just going right this is and i'm like no and then that's my process but then once i'm going i'm i'm done and i don't really trim too much fat i try not oh, to it takes, anyway. me, it takes me ages <laughs> it takes me ages cutting it all out so one of the first videos i saw of yours actually was it was about video editors and your distaste for Caden live <laughs> yeah i thought that might come up <laughs> was it uh, well i i, I still use Caden live um i can't remember the sort of the conclusion of the video but wasn't did you mention olive in that video as well yeah yeah how how do you find olive as a video editor i think it's coming on nicely um it's not there yet it's not quite stable and it, it crashes a few times but in terms of the functionality that i think it's going to end up with i think it might be the one that many of us go to the problem is development seems to be pretty glacial at the moment uh, I believe the developer is rewriting the code completely, so I'm not quite sure why. So nothing <laughs> seems to be moving very fast. I've never. I just have something. to mention uh, on their website it says Olive is making rapid progress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> relatively. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is it worth checking out? Then I've never really sat down and used it. I would check it out. It's pretty good. Um, I, d I wouldn't use it as your, your main editor, but it's worth having a look at and, and seeing what it can do. What really, what, what really turned you off, Cade, <clears throat> Cade and Live? Then, um, okay, <laughs> you have to understand that I have really conservative hardware here. I run a little in Intel Nook. Before you start, yeah. actually, is that what? What do you run your channel off? What What is your hardware? It's an Intel Nook, little right, box, size okay. of a cigarette packet. Yeah, yeah, I know the one. That, that, yeah, i five processor, sixteen gig of RAM, NVMe drive. So that's it, wow. with lots plugged into the USB cards and dual HD screens. How and much all the power rest does that draw with everything plugged into it? Uh, I haven't got a clue. <laughs> Not very much, <laughs> but 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 I have powered USB hubs and and everything else so okay so when i first started this channel um i'd never done video editing before and i moved to open shot mm -hmm. and first one i ever used it's okay it's a bit clunky uh, but it's okay yeah you know? um but as i kind of got into it and started doing additional things you know me little pop-ups and things like that you know the subscribe now stuff I thought, well, I'll I'll go and have a look at um, KDN Live, which everybody seems to be recommending. Mm -hmm. And uh, I initially got put off a little bit because I don't like the look of a QT interface at all. I'm a, I'm very much a GTK man. But uh, once I managed to get a dark theme to cover that up, I thought, right, let's give it a go. 
And yeah, I mean, it's functionality, it's effects, it's great. The problem I have with it is there's no hardware encoding on it. You know, I can use the VA API on this uh, little Intel NUC box, but it doesn't use that. Right. So when I'm encoding video, it drives my CPU at 100%. And Ooh. yeah, all the way. And it's very, very slow. And the temperature was climbing to 90, 95 degrees. And it crashed. Does it have fans in it, the NUC? It has a little fan. Right, okay. So I initially thought it might be my hardware. And I, I took my hardware apart. I pulled the processor, put some Arctic silver on it, you know, re-gunked re it. And I actually replaced the fan, put it all back together. No difference. And I lived with that six or seven months. Right. What I was finding, though, was each version would be more or less stable. And when I was doing that video on KDN Live, it came about because I came across an issue where I was trying to drop a MOV file, mm -hmm. um, which is one of my little subscribe now pop-ups into it. Right. And every time I tried to do it, KD KDN Live crashed. So, what was you using it on? What disk drive and what package format? Arch, and uh, I, I was originally using the standard one out of the repos. Right now, now my approach to when I'd found a dodgy KDN Live in the past, which I'd found many times, oh yeah, would, would, would be to get a flat pack. Right, I, and I, try the flat. Pack. I found the app image was the most uh, stable. Right, for me. yeah. So anyway, so so I couldn't get it to work. Um, so I thought, right, well, I'm, this isn't you. I hate video editing. I don't want to fiddle with the program. I just want something that does it fast, quickly, and it's done. So I started playing with other packages, and Shotcut does everything I need. It does hardware encoding, uses the VA API. It doesn't drive my processor above 65%. It's three times faster than KDN Live in the rendering. Wow. And uh, it does the job, and it's never crashed on me. So I decided to dump KDN Live, as, as the video said. And uh, I had a really interesting, shall we say, response from the, on the video. What was the, res <laughs> what was the overall response? Do you remember? It was 50-50, really, between those who said, yeah, I've had exactly the same experience, right. uh, in including Martin Wimpress. Oh, wow, who okay. uh, made a comment and said, I, I've run the same sort of tests, uh, Steve, and I came to exactly the same conclusions as you. You should use Shotcut. Hmm. And then, of course, you had the fans, and uh, we came up with some stupid comments, really. You know, oh, yeah, it's not Caden Live. It's the distro you're running. Change your distro. Well, I'm not likely to change my distro because no. a video editor is, is working. Or, yeah, you need to get yourself an i9 processor. Then it'll work <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. right okay okay another moronic comment you know um so uh most of them could be annoyed and uh, ignored completely and then others that would say oh what you need to do is you need to go into the k uh, den live settings you need to do this that oh i can't be bothered Can, you know i'm not interested in video editing software if i've got to fiddle with it to make it work i'm not interested from the word go and then we had others that said, use the app image. That's what you should be using. So I said, right, okay, I'll, I'll download the app image and give that a go. And yes, it, it could handle the mod file. So it was that particular version yeah. of KDN Live that was causing problems. Still drove my CPU at 100%. So, yeah, for my particular setup, it, it's a no-goer. It's just not worth it. What hardware have you got, Zeeb? Uh, well, at the minute, I have a Ryzen 7 1800X that occasionally uh, hard lockups because of a <laughs> persistent AMD microcode and kernel bug that I don't think is ever going to get fixed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen the um the the new KDE Slimbook stuff with the uh, I think it's using AMD as well now, isn't it? Rising. Yeah, I I did see that. I can't. I think really it's cool. got a four thousand series or something in it, isn't it? Um, I can't remember. I'd be quite interested in getting a little review of that, to be honest, and seeing what it's like. 
I think, yeah, the, oh, hang on, the, yeah, it's got a 4800H in it. What's the price of this one? Is there, is there any prices for it at the moment? Uh, the article I'm looking at on OMG Ubuntu yeah. says price from, from, in big quotes, oh, 899 euros. Right, so that'll be the same in pounds then at the, as, as a minimum. Yeah, basically. Um, Pretty much. Yeah. Have you have have either of you ever used any sort of Linux specific laptops, hardware, or anything like that? A long time ago. Do you remember the uh, Asus EPC? I remember the EPC. I didn't know there was like a a Linux version. Yeah, I didn't they know started that. off coming ship. They were shipped with um, Xandros, an early oh, version. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it wasn't great, <laughs> but yeah. I did. You, I did at the time. Uh, I had about three different EPCs because um, I'd spent a lot of time, or I was spending a lot of time on the road then, and so I needed a hotel laptop. Right. And uh, the EPC was about the right size, and I think at the time I had Ubuntu on it, mm -hmm. and it worked great. You know, I, I had no issues with it. I mean, now I, I only sort of use old ThinkPads. I've got a whole collection. I've got an old ThinkPad actually. I really like the thing. I need to um, I'll get a new battery yeah. for it though. The battery lasts like no time at all anymore. What is it? What type? T four four something or other. I'll dig it out. Four four TP. That might be the one. Yeah. It's got the hardware buttons. And yeah. the thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I like it. Classic. Classic. Yeah. Classic. Yeah. So have I you... do also have a ThinkPad. But it's one of the newer ones. Which it's one? The, it is the first generation X1 Yoga. Is it? Is oh that yeah, yeah. The one with the hinge. Uh, yeah, the foldy roundy one. How's that? Uh, it works pretty well under Linux. There's a couple of specific hardware features that don't, don't work, um, but they're hardware features that I'm not really bothered about. So, like the um, Y gig dock. I don't think works yet. And what, um, what do you have installed the on it? Fingerprint. I I have OpenSUSE on it, of course, Tyler. Come on. Have you tried? <laughs> have you tried any other distros to see if that fingerprint scanner works? Uh, I have, yeah. and last I checked, it does not. But there might be a snap that has the driver really? in it, maybe, possibly, or something. And I was looking at it the other day, and I was like, uh, I'm not installing a snap just to make my fingerprint sensor work, because I don't miss it. I, I was, actually don't miss it. So I was playing around with my laptop the other day, which is, uh, I've got an Acer laptop here as well, which has got a little fingerprint scanner on it, and I've never managed to get it to work with Linux. And I just booted up Ubuntu 20.04, and just straight away <laughs> detected it, it was working. I was like, what? <coughs> That's very yeah. No, twenty oh four does it still doesn't have uh, drivers for it, unfortunately. Oh, With yeah. the older ThinkPads, you don't tend to have a problem. You can usually get the fingerprint yeah. print scanner working. You yeah. have to do a bit of searching, but it's a weird fingerprint scanner on my one though. It's one like you drag <laughs> your finger over the top of instead of placing it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So you, you, literally, the old ones work like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. It works yeah. out of the box though, which is quite cool. Right. Have you seen the Ubuntu web distro that's apparently in the works? No. Tell me more. Um, well, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's, so you know the Ubuntu Unity Remix guys? Yeah. They're, they're planning yeah. on releasing an Ubuntu web. I think that's literally the name of it, which is aiming to be a Chrome OS alternative using Firefox. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thoughts? <laughs> I can't see me running out to get it. <laughs> no, I, no, I've noticed um, there's so many Ubuntu remixes coming out at the moment. It's it's getting a bit crazy. Yeah, I know. Which leads me on to actually the Ubuntu Cinnamon stuff. Did you see the link I sent you earlier, uh, Zero? I did, and I kind of skim read it, um, and I saw like the mentions of about. Uh, trying to get the packages either upstream to Ubuntu and then it being really difficult to do that for whatever reason. And then they were like, okay, well, can we upstream it to Debian instead? And yeah. then, yeah, I was just like, okay. But I like I have this inner 
very inner thing that I said to you earlier where I was like, I just do not understand the Ubuntu Cinnamon Remix. So I'm in two minds about it. I, do you feel like it should have, a, as they say, official flavorship status or whatever? I mean, I don't really see why, like what the need for it would be. What niche would it fill to be a flavor? It would fill the niche of people who don't want to not use Snap on Linux Mint. But then it's like, you know, could you, you could just re-enable snaps on the next mint, right? Yeah, I think some people are quite tribal though, don't they? When when like something doesn't go their way or a decision's made that they're against, they might just jump ship. And I think that is where it would get most of his users from, to be honest. Yeah. And then I was kind of thinking, well, the latest release of Ubuntu Budgie has that funky little layout editor switcheroo yeah i like it yeah and it's like well can we not just have that and just kind of change that into something that looks more i will say cinnamon like i I was kind of like "Mm, i don't really so i quite like the ubuntu cinnamon remix purely because i actually quite like their panel switching little app thing because the the unity layout Mm. on that just yeah i'm a sucker for a unity layout to be fair (laughs) I reviewed it. I thought it was okay. Um, the developer of that um, Cinnamon Remix, though, he was on Biddle this morning, and uh, there was some issues he was talking about. Uh, I wish I'd listened more carefully now, but I was eating my breakfast at the time. Um, and he's obviously chasing flavor status. Yes. And uh, he, he's he's been asked to, to remove some packages. Mm-hmm. So there seems to be a big thing going on about that. Well, yeah, so I think they're... They did the blog post about it, and I think they they seem quite deflated about it. Mm, he sounded it. Yeah. I don't know. How many flavours are there now? Like eight? Goodness knows. Hold on, let's rattle them off, right? We've got Kubuntu, Zubuntu. Lubuntu. Lubuntu. Budgie. We've got Ubuntu Studio, Ubuntu Budgie. There is a lot now, isn't there? And that's just the official ones, so like... I'll be honest, I'm I'm quite up for a, a Unity sort of remix to be fair with you, so I'm 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 all good with that one. But yeah. Ubuntu Lumia mm-hmm. was one that was sort of appearing here and there, but I think they've dropped the idea entirely of doing an Ubuntu remix. Lumia, I mean I've only looked at that desktop on uh, Project Trident. Ah uh, yeah, so when they switched over from um, the BSD base. I can't say I was particularly impressed with that. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because I think mm-hmm. I think what they're sort of they, it was being marketed as the um, the Ubuntu Lumia version is like a lightweight Ubuntu, but there's already like two lightweight Ubuntu's now, isn't there? I guess. Mm. Yeah. It, do you know what always kind of put me off about the Lumina desktop when I when I had to look at it before? It gave me very strong um, KDE three and a half KDE four vibes. Yeah, I get that actually. Yeah. I can, see where, you, I can like, see where you're coming from, actually. I hadn't put two and two together, but now that you say it, mm. yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that just, like, I just have kind of flashbacks to when I was first starting out with um, Linux and trying out sort of the GNOME versus KDE distros and just being like, oh my God, this is awful. <laughs> you know? <laughs> What's the, um, what sticks out in your mind as the worst desktop environment you've both used? Oh boy! Yeah. Uh, right, <laughs> let me have a have a think about that. Um, what is? I don't know. Worst is right. Trying. The most irritating mm-hmm. has probably been deep in. Wow. Well, how come? I just hate the look and feel of it. Really, I appreciate. Yeah, I appreciate its functionality, but I just don't like the the shiny itis that it's got. It's 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 just horrible. Prefer, don't like it at all. I prefer deep in like the fifteen series to the newer ones because all of these rounded edges. Oh yeah, yeah. A bit much. I know. I know. Yeah. What about you? We should all just move to Slackware. <laughs> yeah, I noticed that on your hat there. <laughs> I thought I'd give it some love today. I still use Slackware. I've got it installed on one of my ThinkPads. Uh, always got a version of Slackware installed. I've been using it for 15 years Wow! in uh, one form or another. Have you used... Uh, go on. Sorry. I was going to say, have, then, you, have you used the Enlightenment desktop much? 
No. <laughs> in fact, the only time that I've, that I've used enlightenment and it's not the real enlightenment as you know is when i did the bodhi review yeah that's, uh, the other week don't they mark don't they give that a different name on there as well for the desktop environment mo- mo- it's some sort of fork um the, the, uh, mosh, mosh yeah mosh, yeah something like mosh, that yeah yeah. yeah yeah i thought it was all right um i think it fills a niche you know for a lightweight distro i was quite impressed with it and uh I had a long chat with a developer who contacted me afterwards, and right. uh, es- essentially it's a one-man band, and uh, he's doing what he can, and he's aware of some of the paper cuts that need fixing, um, and he does want to get it kind of up to date with the latest version of Ubuntu as soon as he can, but it's him on his own, and uh, he's he's had a few health issues during this virus, and it's it's all kind of slowed down development at the moment. We've had this but discussion. I- Go on. We've had the discussion on it before about um, one man band distros, actually, and you've just mm. brought it up again. Do you think that, that it, it, they're kind of just giving themselves far too much to really do? Yeah, in a word. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And I think a lot of good distros are going to fall by the wayside because I think people are underestimating how much work it is going into it. I mean, the classic one, I suppose, is coming back to Slackware. Mm-hmm. It's essentially a one-man outfit, uh, Patrick, Patrick Volkerding. Um, but he doesn't do the development completely on his own now. You know, there are other people who help him a lot, uh, help him out with it. But essentially, it's still a one-man driven thing. Um and of course, we're all waiting. Well, I say we're all probably not that many of us really in the big scheme of things. Those of us who like Slackware are all waiting for the next stable release, fifteen, because it's been two and a half years or something now. A few months so, ago, I tried to get a rough estimate of the actual user base of Slackware, and I couldn't. I couldn't for the life of me work it out. I don't think it's very large, though. No, I'm, it's it's got a very committed and loyal user base. Uh, I, I don't think it's growing. Um, no. it, it, it's a strange sort of distro in a way. It, it, it's very much uh, old style. Back in the day in 2004, it was one of the easiest to install. It was one of the distros that everything just worked once I'd installed it. And that was strange and unusual back in the day because, you know, Nothing worked, let's face it. You, you didn't expect sound or wireless or anything to actually work after you installed a distro. But I got it all working, you know, with, with Slackware, and I, I've sort of stuck with it. I don't use it as my main driver, but there's something about it. I, I just, once you've got it fully configured, it's a really solid little system. Yeah, yeah I've never actually used Slackware like at all. Yeah, it's a solid system, and... Uh, it's very You've old. got to work at it. Yeah, as far as I'm aware, the, the config's all still very old school, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's not even uh, System V. It's uh, BSD-style configs, right. basically. Yeah. But because of that, I mean, it, it's dead easy to, to configure. Interesting. Do they, have a, do they have, like, a main desktop? Yeah. Well, it comes with uh, fully loaded with KDE, XFCE. Okay. Uh, does it come with anything else? And a few window managers. Um, and you can add additional repositories to run the latest version of Plasma or Mate or whatever else you want. The thing that gets people is it doesn't have a package manager no. that does automatic dependency, dependency resolution, sort of. Um but you can add uh, a number of tools to it. I use something called SBO Tools that sort of does dependency resolution, but it very much de- depends if all the dependencies are written into the build file right. of the program that you're actually compiling. Um, but to be honest, it, it comes with all the development tools already pre-installed. So most of the time, the majority of dependencies are already there on the basic system. It's not as much work as you possibly fear. Oh, I don't fear to it. To get it up and running. Oh, I think time. Yeah. yeah. It, it doesn't take that long to, no. to configure. I might no. check it out. No more than Arch. Fair play. Did, um, mm. You done the video with the um, Easy Arch installer, didn't you, a little while ago? Uh, 
Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, Fresnics. Yeah, I've never I'm actually quite, checked I, it out. Is it? I'm, I'm quite impressed at that. Um, I've been watching. I don't know if you watch his channel, but yeah, he's, do, been yeah, fight, yeah. he's been fighting that thing for the last couple of months, and um, I've been trying to get out in virtual box along the way. Right. Uh, and it got to the stage that I thought to myself. He's now got it so you can do a fully automated uh, install with his choices as far as partitioning are concerned. Okay. What but if... it's now easy as well to do a semi-automated install and do your own partitioning. How does it automatically partition and what is the scheme? So he automatically goes for, uh, well, he's got a mixture of, you know, BIOS and UEFI options. But if you take the UEFI option, mm -hmm. um, he'll create a... Obviously, a UEFI partition, you get the choice of a root partition of 20, 40, or 60 gigs, right. nothing in between. And you get the choice of a swap partition of two, four, or eight, if, if, if I remember correctly. Okay. And he will always mount the ESP on forward slash EFI. Mm -hmm. So apart from choosing one of those options, that's what you're going to get. Right. But for me, the big thing is you can just do your, your own partitioning, mount all the partitions exactly as you want them, and then you just miss out the section in uh, his script that talks about partitioning. So you get the system you want anyway, and it's it's convenient. Do you think that's what people want, is just, just a convenience? Or do you think there's a lot of people out there that are kind of just don't want to install Arch the normal way? I think there's a lot of people out there who don't want to install Arch the normal way. Yeah. And, and I know that I had, um, let's call it a debate, in one particular group I'm on where somebody was commenting on the video and, and saying, you know, what's the point? Just install Manjaro. You know, it, it, all you have to do, it comes with a Calamaris, blah. And, I, and what I was trying, the point I was trying to make was, yes, there's nothing wrong with Man Manjaro. It's a great distro, but it's not Arch. No. It's a variation of Arch. You know, they hold back packages. They they do their own theming and colouring. So you're not going to get vanilla Arch. If you want vanilla Arch, and it's what I want, I yeah. don't want anybody to tell me what theming I'm going to have. I want the packages directly as the developer intended. This is just a quick way to install it. Have you ever installed so, Arch Zero? No, I have never, never done it. Never tried it. I I did try Manjaro at some point. Yeah. Um, I've I've never installed Arch the Arch way. Um, I don't even think I've tried Endeavor OS actually. If you come to think of Endeavor, it, Endeavor's good as well. Yeah. It's quite close to um, vanilla, kind of. Yeah. It has its own repo for some packages. Yeah. That's the only thing that you know. I think I think yep. Endeavor does serve a purpose though, because I did quite like an Antergos and an, Antigos, or, and I was Antergos, quite, yeah. I was quite sad when that left, but Endeavor's like the spiritual successor of it or something. It is, isn't yeah. It? yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I, I was thinking actually the, the other week um, of when I eventually install some kind of off the wall terminal sort of distro, and I was actually thinking I'd probably make it void. Yeah, that that wouldn't be a bad choice. Yeah, um, because it, it it's installers kind of you know it takes a lot of the pain out of some of the stuff that Arch makes you do, but you can still have it just boot you straight to a a command line. I think it's an easier installer. Yeah, and um, sort of for learning things like uh, one of the things that I actually found really interesting when I was playing around with it in a VM was how run it starts mm -hmm. services how, mm -hmm. how you make services um start just, automatically and you just make just a drop simple a link. Link. yeah just drop a link in a directory yeah and i was like <laughs> actually that's pretty damn cool i kind of like that um and i'm not sh i'm not sure whether arch does that or not with well well, well, well arch is system d, d. System d arch is yeah system d. Uh, I mean, with Slackware, it's even easier. You just have a directory with all the service files there. And if you want to turn one on, you just do a chmod plus x. <laughs> That's yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I've, I've been running Void now for... When did I do the review? A couple of months ago. 
and yeah. I, I've been really impressed with it. I mean, I, it's it's an easy install, but there's quite a few paper cuts to get over. Um, things not quite working as you'd want, and so I spent a bit of time on the Reddit forum, just uh, kind of doing a bit of digging and asking questions. But um, I managed to get it up and running and fully configured, and I really like it. it it's it's a good system. It runs very lightweight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I've got the XFC desktop on it, but I'm also running DWM and Xmonad on it, and it seems to be bulletproof. Yeah, you don't. That... It's it's rolling release, but you don't get drowned in the updates that you do with Arch. What's the package manager called again on Void? XBP, XBPS. Mm -hmm. I like the fact that it's it's not a fork of a fork of a fork of a fork. I um, I quite like uh, distros that are a thing in themselves and not based on something else. That winds me up a bit. Did you see a video I done on something called Relax? R e l e a x. <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's um it's a really funny story actually. I, I quite liked what I saw so far, but right. the whole reason why I even looked at it was because it's um I think it's from an Indian developer, and the English isn't amazing. So when I was like, on the website, he was like, "Yeah, if you're wondering why the, there's an extra, what was it, really acts." What letter did he include in relax he shouldn't have done? He added the A. Yeah, on on his main website, it's like, yeah, if you're wondering why there's an extra A in relax, it's because uh, I've, I was up late and there was a spelling mistake and I'd already registered the domain. And that just really <laughs> cracked me up. So I just downloaded it and installed it, but I really quite liked it. Again, that's an independent, not a fork of a fork of a fork. Might, yep. Yeah, it might be worth checking out. I mean, at the end of the day, Ubuntu's a fork of Debian, isn't it? Yeah. It's more than that now, yeah. but that's how it started off. Um, someone mentioned something about Debian Day, didn't they, in the Discord earlier? Zero. Oh yeah, the the anniversary. Is it the anniversary of when it started or something? I don't like know. That? I I didn't know. Is it? Yeah. When I is think it? it's basically it's Cake Day. Yeah, yeah. Aren't right. they? Didn't they say like um, you could sort of like host <laughs> your own sort of like little celebration thing if you've got a YouTube oh, channel yeah. or something. I think that'd be quite cool to do actually if we done like a yeah. like a podcast on that day. That could be quite cool. I think. It's on the 16th of August. 16th of August. I'll pop it in the calendar. And so, oh. oh, that's that's conveniently a Sunday. There you go. We could do a little episode oh. there. <laughs> <laughs> I like Debian. That's. I mean, there are two distros that I use all the time. Arch is my main driver for play. But for work, for my paid work, um, my boss saw one of my videos and decided that That'd be good. You can do videos for us as well. <laughs> so because because I work in training, and I have Debian, Debian installed on this machine, stable, and I use yeah stable, and I use Debian exclusively for doing the videos for work. No. So and it's bulletproof, and and I've got Debian for my VPS because you're not going to use Arch as a server operating system, are you? Let's be honest. I think people have tried. I'm sure they have, but yeah, yeah you'd have to be very brave. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't that brave. What would it take both of you to leave your current distributions of choice? Like, what would be like the worst thing to happen that would make you jump ship? Mm, for me, it would probably be something like uh, Suso would either have to get bought out by some company that i absolutely despise or um they'd have to be changing some of the defaults to something horrendous or, or you know just changing like too much of it to be yeah. something else so i'd be like well why does it why do i not just use to something else so would there would there uh, be like a something like philosophical or like ideological that would change it would make you sort of be like well uh I'll let you go first. <laughs> it, well, I, I don't know because I, I don't really know what the open source of philosophy is. I don't think they really than... know at the moment either. There was a lot of no, trouble exactly. on the on the board lately. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I spoke to you about that recently, actually. I, I tell you what, the one thing would be that would absolutely make me get rid of open source forever and never look back. If they got rid of Geeko 
as the mascot, that would just ruin me forever. Yeah, it's my favourite you know? mascot, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for me, it would have to be something like uh, they decided they were no longer going to have the AUR on a hatch. Yeah, that'd be a big <laughs> one. Because the AUR is what makes it. Um, I, I'm a heavy user of the AUR for various packages. And um, it's what creates, well, it's what makes Arch the go to distro for me because you pick any package that you can name. If it's on GitHub, the chances mm -hmm. are it's in the AUR and you can install mm -hmm. it. But if it was just some problem, I mean, I think I talked in, in one of my videos that I'm one of these strange people that when things break, although it's often annoying, another part of me goes, great, time to fix it. And I quite like getting down and dirty and finding out what's going on. Okay, I'll lead you on to the next question. And what do you? Th I always kind of get a bit annoyed when someone has a problem with a distro, and the automatic answer from someone in the community is like, "Try this distro." I often, yeah. th I think that's very counterproductive. Yeah, I'd agree. That the whole point, if you're going to use Linux, you have to learn how to maintain Linux yourself, mm -hmm. and. Often it's no more than doing a few Google searches and looking through forums. What you're looking for, often if you're new to Linux, is how or steps you can take that might fix the problem yeah. that you've got. Telling you to just move on and use another distro is counterproductive. So, it's a workaround rather than a yeah. solution, right? Yeah. yeah. So Zero dropped, uh, almost dropped his beloved distro because of Spyro. I don't know if you know this. No. Yeah, man. <laughs> but I, I finished the game now, my dude. It's all good. Was it good? Did it's it? All good. Was it a good ending? I've never played Spyro for more than five. Minutes. It, it was. A good, it was a good three endings, mate. There's three games in there. Oh, you've been busy. Yeah. Although I did find out so that the second one, you know, I said I had the problem with the cutscenes not yep. working, and I had to use uh, the glorious egg roll version of Proton. Um, I found out every three cutscenes <laughs> is when the game would black screen and i found what i had to do was drop to a tty session uh -huh. log in as root open htop to kill the process the game was running in <laughs> and then exit the root account and log back in as me and then i could start the game again and play it for another three cutscenes, and then exit I had to do that's so thing. strange isn't it <laughs> but yeah it was every it was it was like clockwork every three cutscenes, so i could play one world go into the next one, watch the opening cutscene, but then I couldn't leave it. <laughs> I don't know if you saw the... Um, I don't know. So Glorious Egg Roll recently done a tweet, actually. Hold on, I'll read it. Welp, easy anti-cheat was working. They pushed an update today and that it broke on Linux for all games that it was working on. Wow. Yeah. Good job, easy anti-cheat. Yeah, I don't think you're much of a gamer, are you, uh, OTB? Uh, never got beyond patience and solitaire. <laughs> <laughs> I've got three sons who are all PC gamers, but I've I've never yeah. But the tr done it. the real question is, have you got them running Linux? I got all of them running Linux because when they were growing up, um, I ended up building computers for them, and uh, they all got Linux installed on them. And I remember the hassles of getting World of Warcraft running, <laughs> and uh, I, I I did get it running for all of them. Um, so now the well, they're all mid to late 20s. One of them still runs Linux. The others have gone to Windows, I'm afraid. Do either of you have any Windows remnants on any like machines in your sort of... Yeah. Yeah, I have still dual boot. Right. Not that I go into it. Um, to be honest, the only reason I use Windows now uh, is to do firmware upgrades on SSDs and to do mm -hmm. BIOS upgrades. Mm. and that's it because it, as you know it's not there's not always the facilities to do it within linux so mm. i tend to run a copy of windows just for that nothing else and what about you zero have you got any leftover windows sort of remnants anywhere um no i don't think i've actually got it installed anywhere because fortunately my pc and my server i can update the bios through a USB drive. Right. Right. So you just pack the file onto the USB drive and update that. The only thing I know that I've got that does still run something that 
resembles Windows is my sat nav for my car runs Windows CE. Really? <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> behind the, behind the scenes, it's Windows. Is that, CE. Is that still a thing? <laughs> I thought well, that was died to death years ago. Yeah, it, it must still be a thing, or they must still have a license for it or something. Right. So the, the only way I can update the maps is to use Windows. But let's face it, how often do you need what to does update the C that? What does the CE stand for? Uh oh god, compact, compact edition, edition or some yeah, something like, like that. that. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Like, do you remember? Find out before like smartphones were a thing. I had one of those like um, Windows PDAs or, or whatever they called it. Do you remember them? When they first came out, yeah, I liked those. Yeah. I thought it was quite cool actually. Yeah. Well, well, of course, I used to have that half brick. Oh, the <laughs> back big, in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> The biggest phone I ever had was when phones started to become a thing. There was like, I had like a Motorola, which still had like a little antenna on it. Yeah, yeah, enjoyed oh, that. Yeah. What phone have you got? Oh, you've, you're on, you're on iPhone, aren't you? OTB. Yeah, sorry guys. And and zero, <laughs> you've got the uh, the Fairphone, Fairphone three. Have you tried? Yeah. Have you tried flashing any different uh, OSs on that? Uh, yeah, I've got Elo. Or slash e OS or whatever, however they're pronouncing it these days. And um, you, have you tried any of the others? I didn't know there were others. <laughs> I think you can flash. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's it's a supported device, isn't it? The Fairphone and, and quite a few of the um, Linux. The Fairphone two is the right. the three has only yeah. just recently had its um, kernel and stuff released for it. So. Because I was looking on eBay to pick up uh, sort of a more powered device than the Pine Phone. Because I really am, I do want to dive into the whole sort of pocket Linux stuff, but the Pine Phone is just so underpowered. Mm. What's it like as an actual phone? Is it uh, usable as a daily driver or? Yeah, I mean, I, I use it for all of my stuff that I need to do. Um, and obviously, with it being. Elo or EOS, um, it doesn't have the Google Play services installed. Sure, um, but it does use Micro G, and I haven't actually had any showstoppers with it. Like I can still do, you know, I can still use my banking apps, okay, which rely heavily on the Google Play services for their mm -hmm. security. Um, I can still watch Netflix on it. I can still, you know get firefox and stuff through it and it, it so far it's actually doing pretty well i think it's probably more ready yeah. than what the um the pine phone and sort of um, the you know the distros available for that are to be honest with you the ecosystem's just not quite ready for mobile i don't think i think we'll get there yeah um, definitely. i think i think we're a few years off i mean it seems to have been going on for many years now and we don't see we're making some progress but the progress mm. has been quite limited if you look at the progress that Linux on the desktop has made in the same period, Linux on the phone has been, it's been sluggish. It's really mm. quite, it feels really rewarding though to use it mm. as opposed right. to like, a, what have I got at the moment? I've got some Galaxy at the moment and I like, I much prefer just sitting and playing around with the Pine phone, even though it's really sluggish and it takes forever to do anything. Then I do yeah. on my actual phone because it's just a bit boring, isn't it? You know, and there's no. Oh, yeah, yeah. I really hope it does come to fruition. Yeah, mm. it's just a work tool for me. The phone. I mean, you you mentioned watching Netflix on a phone. Do people do that? Do you actually watch Netflix on a phone? Not not that occasionally, but if it's like you know, I'm sort of out and about somewhere, and I haven't got my laptop or whatever. If I if I'm staying over at a friend's or something it's kind of handy to to have it there but I, I don't watch it on there routinely i use my laptop on my pc for that most of the time have you i i can't even watch netflix or youtube on the computer screen i have it set up on my tv wow nice have you updated your iphone to any of the beta releases at the moment no no i don't i don't mess with it it's not a hobby it's just a work tool so I updated my iPad to the the public beta just to have a little play around mm -hmm. with it. It's quite it's sort right. of like they've they've now got actual widgets. Right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> <laughs> but they're very well designed widgets. To be fair, they are. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, one of the main reasons that that I use this more than anything else 
I've had lot, you know, I swap and change phones all the time, and I've had Androids and of various types. Nexus Five was the one I liked the most mm. in in recent years, but because I live in a little village and uh, there's all this talk about five G, four G, three G, we don't get three G. Wow. You're lucky if we get a phone signal, okay. and in fact, I don't get a phone signal where I am, so I rely entirely on Wi-Fi calling, Man. completely. And I just think the iPhone does it particularly well. So I relied on, uh, I had a flat up in an area, like the, the posher part of my area. And surprisingly, there was just no signal anywhere there. So I survived off Wi-Fi calling, but I could only get Sky Broadband at the time, which was an absolute nightmare. Right. I know you've got your own internet sort of troubles, haven't you, at the moment? Oh. Well, um, yeah, I, I was I was really worried about this um, this, to be honest, because I thought... I rarely get more than three meg up. Right. And so I thought this was... And I've tried doing the live streams, private live streams to test mm -hmm. in YouTube, and I just get buffering all the time. It's horrible. Um, but I live in an area where when we first moved here back in 2012, all that there was was copper cables coming over telegraph wires. wires. That was it. There's no cable. There's no. There was no fiber, no nothing. Um mm -hmm. So we now have fiber to a cabinet. And <laughs> um, so it's got me 30 meg down and about three up. Uh, this is worth talking about, actually, because I'm quite interested in this. Now, I've moved a few places in this village. And one of the places, I was actually able to get wireless ADSL. Because up on one of the hills at the top of the valley, they have this antenna. And there's mm -hmm. this rural internet company called Boundless that will connect you. And uh, they come and fit a dish on your roof, and it was brilliant. Okay, it was not incredibly fast. I think I got 30 down, 10 up, right. but it was mm -hmm. solid. It never dropped. As soon as I moved house, we lost sight of the antenna because trees were in the way, so that was that. So I had to go back to, you know, through a normal phone line. And I've, I've had ter terrible trouble. I, and I rang BT, and BT couldn't offer me anything more. And then I had a conversation with Vodafone on Friday. And they said, oh, yeah, we, we can offer you 60 meg down and 57 and a, sorry, 57 and a half meg down and 11 meg up. Have you done like a check on that, though? Uh, well, no, I haven't. I wouldn't even know how to. Uh, I don't know how Vodafone does it, but uh, a lot of uh, ISPs that you, there's like a portal you can go on where it will give you like an average speed of what you'll actually connect at your area. Right, okay. I, I mean, I've done that, and it does seem to confirm, you, right. you know, what they're saying. So I'm mm. saying, so how, given that you're using the same network as BT and all the rest of them, I was using EE before, mm -hmm. how are you doubling the download speed and more than doubling the upload speed? And they gave me all this guff about, well, we took over the old cable and wireless network, so we've still got that in the area, and also our the line that we use, the feed, has a really low contention ratio compared to the likes of BT and EE and Sky. Who knows? Mm -hmm. I'm going to have it fitted. It's due to be fitted on the 7th. I'll let you know. Um, uh, I can't really see how it's going to be much different, but I'm mm -hmm. hoping it will be and I can actually start doing some live streams. Well, for what it's worth, your internet's been absolutely fine during this entire call. I've been surprised. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, yeah, yeah. I think on that note, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to wrap it up. Is there anything you guys want to just say before we, we end it there? Well, we finished already. We well, yeah, have. It's quite good, isn't it? We did very well. It's, it's a quick one for me. Um, yeah. Thank you, guys. Good um, to be on. Would you like to come on as like a returning guest? Yeah, absolutely. Because I think that would be quite cool because the, sort of the, the English Linux sphere is quite small. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah it would be nice to have you back again, Steve. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Come on whenever. Lovely. Take it easy, people. Cheers, guys. See you later. Guys. See you later.